New World is one of those MMOs that, once it hooks you, keeps calling you back for more. And it's not because it's the best MMORPG ever made, because, let's be real, even though it tries, it's not. When giants like Final Fantasy XIV and World of Warcraft have dominated the MMO scene for years, it's tough for a new game to compete. These games don't just control the market, they also genuinely deliver excellent gameplay with regular updates that keep players engaged with fresh content. I know this alone might make you consider skipping this video, but stick with me. There's more to New World than meets the eye. It's not a perfect game by any means, but it has a lot of potential, especially with the recent release on consoles. But before diving into details, let's first talk about what New World actually is and why it's suddenly gaining popularity again. The game originally launched on Steam as a PC exclusive back in 2021, but on October 15th, 2024, it expanded to consoles. For those who might not know, New World is both developed and published by Amazon Games, a company also known for titles like Lost Ark and Throne and Liberty. The latter shares a similar scope with New World, as both were initially promoted as PvP-focused action RPGs. However, after a major update called Eternum, New World seems to have shifted gears to put more emphasis on PvE content. So if you're someone who's been hesitant to try it out, worrying about a PvP-heavy experience with hardcore players lurking to ambush you at every turn, don't worry. This shift means you can enjoy New World without constantly looking over your shoulder. First off, to participate in PvP, you need to join one of the game's three factions, the Covenant, Marauders or Syndicate. Each faction has its own unique colour, motivations and leaders. If you join one and later decide it's not for you, don't worry, you can switch factions every 30 days without any issues. This way you could farm all the rewards from one faction and then switch to another to start fresh if you want, though that's another level of detail. To actually fight against other players, you need to activate the PvP flag. If you don't enable it, even being in a faction won't make you a target and you also won't be able to attack others. However, you might still encounter players with red names, which means they've enabled PvP, likely for bonuses rather than for actual fighting. So, right after starting the game, we're greeted by a welcoming message and some basic settings. Right after that, we can choose our own server. The game lets you play on any server you like, as long as your internet can handle it. Once you pick a region, you'll see all the available servers for that area. Right now, all of them have low populations since the game was just released. And at the time of recording this video, it's been only two days or maybe even less since launch. Once we've chosen our server, we're shown the game's first cutscene, which we'll skip here to avoid spoilers. Right after that, we go straight into character creation. The classes or archetypes in this game seem numerous and varied, right? Each comes with unique weapons, roles like tank, damage dealer, healer and their own trade skills. But even with all this in front of you, the class you start with doesn't hold much weight by the time you reach endgame. I say this because New World follows a system similar to Elder Scrolls, more or less. You can start with any class and still use any type of weapon and wear any armour. These initial classes are really just a starting point for a specific build, but you can always respect your character and change your class on the spot. So, choose what appeals to you now because you'll eventually try out all the weapons and armour types in the game, each of which can be levelled up the more you use it. Once we pick the class we want to start with, we head into character creation, which is, unfortunately, quite limited. Character creation in New World is one of the most limited I've seen. Sure, you have a decent number of face options and hairstyles, but there are no sliders to customise your character. No body sliders, no face sliders, nothing. You're stuck working with preset options without the flexibility to make a unique character, which is, honestly, a bit disappointing. After we create our character and name it, we start in the beginner's zone. 
which essentially serves as the game's tutorial. Here, we learn the basics of combat, what buttons to press to attack, dodge, block incoming attacks, and so on. Since this re-release is on console, I'm playing on PlayStation with a controller, so the controls may differ from how you remember them on PC. Eventually, after more fighting and exploration, we reach our first boss fight. New World offers many boss battles, especially at the end of dungeons, raids, and even in the open world. Being the first boss, it's not too tough to beat, but it serves as a great tutorial to help players get familiar with the game's mechanics. After defeating the boss and meeting the main villain, we're tossed into the open world, where we encounter our first friendly NPC, Aelstrom. Along with Urda, he gives us the first story quests to complete. This is where we really dive into the game's core. We learn how to hunt, gather resources, craft, and more. New World relies heavily on gathering and crafting, especially in the early levels when you don't have enough gold to buy materials from the auction house, so make sure to grind these early on. But before we dive deeper, let's take a quick look at the character menu. I'll keep it brief, I promise. On the left side, you'll see your equipped armor and weapons, plus other consumable slots that unlock as you level up. To the right is your overall inventory, displaying everything from gathering and hunting materials to weapons and armor. There's also a bio menu, where you can see all details about your character, choose pronouns, and select a title. Next to it, you'll find the Companies tab, but since I'm not in one, we'll skip that. In the journal, you'll find quests and tutorials, pretty straightforward. As for mounts, they're only unlocked if you have the Rise of the Angry Earth DLC. Console players don't need to worry about this since the base game includes the DLC. Now, what about character stats? Remember when I said your starting class doesn't matter because you can switch any time? In the attributes section, you can see each weapon's stats scaling. Some weapons scale with two stats, like dexterity and intelligence for the musket, while others scale with one stat, like the life staff, which only scales with focus. You build around your preferred playstyle, but you can respec anytime by using the respec option at the bottom of the screen. Not only does your character have attributes, but each weapon does too, with each weapon offering two build paths. You can choose the style you enjoy most, most builds work well in both PvE and PvP. And if you're struggling, there are always guides and builds available for games like this one. But to start, just play what feels fun, take your time, and enjoy the experience. Also, the game's map is huge. While it might seem small at first glance, you'll realize just how large it is once you start exploring. Just be cautious about the level requirements for each area. Wandering into a higher level zone when you're underleveled usually means an instant defeat. In the activity finder, you'll find all the endgame activities you can participate in. Of course, before reaching this point, it's recommended to complete the main story quests, tackle side quests for better gear, and simply explore the world. As you can see, the game offers more PvE activities compared to PvP which reflects the game's recent shift toward PvE in its endgame focus. But I have to admit, these activities are fun, highly engaging, and most importantly, very easy to repeat. Now let's dive into the store and season pass. First off, to access the season pass, you need to reach at least level 25, which I'm close to, but we'll start with the shop for now. From my perspective, the shop is pretty fair. There's no pay to win, just skins, colors, and other cosmetic items. They do offer character transfers and time skits, but honestly, the benefits are so minimal that they're not really worth purchasing. If you're planning to buy anything, the season pass might be the better choice since it offers more consistent rewards. Now, is the season pass worth it? Well, that depends on your preferences. It's structured like most other game passes with two reward tracks, one free and one paid. Thankfully, there's no pay to win in the pass either, just skins for your armor and weapons, plus transmog tokens. Yes, this game uses transmog tokens, so you'll need a token to turn an armor piece into a transmog skin. 
but once unlocked, it's yours to use forever. In the end, it's up to you. If you like the theme and the skins offered in this season, then it might be worth checking out. I know I said I'd keep it short, but we haven't even gotten to the settings yet. I'll go through them quickly so you can get a quick overview. First, I recommend turning off most notifications, especially for new players, since they can be distracting. Also, set your bandwidth mode to high for the best graphical quality. The rest of the settings are pretty standard, covering video, audio and social options, similar to what you'd expect in most games. One last note on settings. The key bindings are fully customizable. You can use one of the preset profiles or create your own with custom keybinds, which is something I love to see in games. Options like this add a lot to the experience. Now, back to the story. I want to introduce you to a character who might just steal your heart. Eat ledger, bastards! So, here I am, fighting off the demon hordes, and I'm thinking, how the hell do I get down from up here? So what do you say? Maybe give a girl a hand? I think she might be my favourite character in the story. Even with all the danger we're facing, she's entirely focused on herself and her one goal, getting off the island, no matter the cost. It's a mix of selfishness and courage that's oddly compelling. After freeing her, we have to complete a few quests she assigns, and soon after, we're off to meet her in the nearby town. On our way, we come across our first side quest, which we can accept or skip. Side quests are flexible, you can pick them up anytime, they won't disappear no matter how far you progress in the story. Once we arrive in the town, we'll see players hanging out, some even close to max level, clearly making efficient use of their time. Towns here are central hubs where players can gather, and each town has its own personality and functions. You can even own multiple houses in different towns, decorating them to your taste though in practice they usually just become a handy storage solution. You'll also come across side activities like fishing, which fits right into the survival vibe of this MMO. The fishing mechanics are straightforward and bait is easy to find. Just search the grass, yes, really. Each town also has a trading post, where you can buy and sell items. Plus, all the major crafting stations are here. You can learn new crafting recipes as you go, and I definitely recommend starting crafting early to help boost your level. Higher levels unlock more crafting options and allow you to create higher quality items. If you've played Final Fantasy XIV or Guild Wars 2, you'll know the drill. And here's a tip, gather, hunt and craft as much as you can whenever possible. These skills become essential for endgame and optimizing your character. Playing on a controller, the combat feels incredibly smooth, especially with the auto-lock feature that lets you lock onto a target and stay focused. If you've played games like Dark Souls, you'll get the feel. Combat feels solid and weighty, and I really appreciate the impactful sound design. Every hit sounds and feels realistic, adding to the experience. It's not over-complicated either. The less is more approach really works here making it easy for new players to pick up. If, like me, you've played MMORPGs or action games before, this will feel natural and intuitive. There's tons of room to experiment with different builds, and if you want to change, you can respec anytime. And if you prefer mouse and keyboard, just connect them to your console and play it that way. It just works. Now, I'm sure you're curious about endgame activities, they're quite repeatable, but keep in mind that reaching this stage takes time, so I really recommend not rushing. Enjoy the journey, levelling, crafting and gathering are all part of the fun. When you finally reach the endgame, you'll be choosing between raids and PvP, both of which are pretty intense for a casual player. Especially in raids, you'll need to learn mechanics and have solid game knowledge. I tried jumping into PvP at my current level, but unfortunately, I didn't have much luck. Each time I waited in the queue for almost 10 minutes, but ended up just waiting indefinitely. For the most part, I think I can wrap up my first impressions of New World here, and since we're on the topic, let's answer the classic question, 
Is New World Eternum worth playing? In my opinion, yes, even if the endgame activities aren't entirely your thing, there's always something to do and you can do it efficiently. For example, waiting in queue for a dungeon. You could work on your leatherworking skill in the meantime, leveling up a new weapon, try it in an area where you can also boost your skinning skill, unlocking waypoints, mine some resources along the way. Or, if you feel like it, summon your mount and join a race. They're actually pretty fun. And let's not forget open world PvP. When you turn this option on, not only do you get gathering bonuses, but you can also face off with other players who have PvP enabled for control of resources and territory. So, even if limited endgame activities aren't your style, there's always something engaging to dive into. Overall, the game just has a cosy, immersive vibe. It's nice just to wander around and take it all in. One last thing to mention is that the game isn't free to play. It has a one-time purchase cost, but there's no subscription. Once you've bought it, you can jump in anytime and play as much as you want. And that wraps up this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, please don't hesitate to like the video and maybe even consider subscribing. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.